Welcome to Frank Stajano Explains and to the Algorithms course at the University of Cambridge. Today's topic is dynamic programming. Today's topic and the topic of the next few videos, actually. Dynamic programming is a powerful technique that applies to a large class of problems where uh, a naive, exhaustive search approach would have exponential complexity. If you use dynamic programming instead, these problems can be solved in low polynomial time. A dramatic improvement. Dynamic programming can be quite puzzling if you've never heard of it before. So this very brief video will give a general overview, but experience tells me that it may still not completely make sense the first time you hear about this stuff. In the next few videos I'll work through a few examples, and then after that we can recap and at that point this video will hopefully sound a lot clearer. If you are already experienced with dynamic programming, more power to you, and feel free to watch these uh, numerous examples of application of dynamic programming at high speed, so that you get more quickly to the point where you can open your editor, open your IDE, and start writing code to prove to yourself that you are actually capable of applying these techniques. Take, for example, the DNA problem that I posed in the very first lecture in the course, and write a program that takes two input strings and returns the longest common subsequence between them, uh, longest, the longest or one of the longest, if there are several, uh, of the uh, same length. Of course, not all problems can be solved by dynamic programming. Uh, the problems that can be solved by dynamic programs, programming share certain features which you will have to learn to recognize. Uh, your clue to s for saying, OK, dynamic programming is probably a good idea in this case. So the first of these features is that the problem uh, has many choices, each choice with its own score, and you must find one that has the optimum score. Second property is that the number of choices is too large for trying them all out by brute force, typically an exponential number of choice. The third property is that the optimal solution is made of optimal solutions for smaller sub-problems. And uh, the fourth property is that these sub-problems overlap, and therefore searching for the optimal solution without dynamic programming would typically end up recomputing the same partial solutions many times. To apply dynamic programming, you must first describe the problem top-down in a recursive fashion, describing, as per property 3, the optimal solution in terms of smaller optimal solutions. However, if you then executed this recursive function, uh, you would usually end up conducting an exponential time exhaustive search. And so the main dynamic programming approach is instead bottom-up. You solve the sub-problems uh, starting from the base case, uh, and from smallest to largest, so that wherever a solution requires the solutions to subproblems, these subproblems uh, have already been computed, and you can just look them up. That's the basic, fundamental, uh, bottom-up dynamic programming approach. It is also possible to do dynamic programming in a top-down fashion by uh, going through the recursive expression of the optimal solution, provided you use a trick called memoization. You augment the recursive function with machinery that remembers all previously computed results. So when you do that, uh, the recursion doesn't end up recomputing the same things many times, because if it recognizes that the result was already computed before, then it just looks it up and returns it. In the next few videos, as I said, I'll give examples of problems that I will then solve with dynamic programming. In this video, I will just show you a much easier example that isn't quite dynamic programming, but that demonstrates the perils of wasteful recomputation of intermediate results. As for an introduction to dynamic programming, I'm first going to mention something that is not dynamic programming, but will give you some ideas about uh, some pitfalls that uh, dynamic programming uh, may expose you to. So you are uh, familiar with the well-known Fibonacci sequence, where uh, starting with 1 and 1, 
you add them together and you get two, you add the last two numbers together, you get three, you add the last two numbers together, you get five, you add the last two, and you get the next one. You add the last two numbers together to get the next one. So you were exposed to that uh, in kindergarten and you've seen that this is the way that leaves are arranged around the stalk, is the way that uh, uh, if you continue, you get the, um, the golden ratio and uh, Greek temples and all the beautiful things. Uh, now, it's fun when you are just a few years old to compute the successive um, numbers in the Fibonacci sequence. When you become a computer scientist or a budding computer scientist and you get exposed to recursion, then uh, your brain gets polluted into thinking that uh, it's cooler to compute them in reverse by saying, okay, uh, Give me the, um, I don't know, the 30th Fibonacci number, okay? So Fibonacci of n equals 30. If n is less than 2, then I can find the, the answer very easily because it's at the bottom. But otherwise, the result is going to be the sum of Fibonacci of 29 and Fibonacci of 28. And you do that by saying Fibonacci of 29. I go back in here, 29, uh, read the recursive by 28 and 27. And then when I finish with that, uh, I will do the 28 and I will add it up. So if you write this type of program, a very simple uh, recursive program to compute Fibonacci sequences, uh, and you run it on something like, for example, 30, you will think that your computer got stuck because you say Fibonacci 30. Oh, oh, oh. Nothing works. Uh, why is that? Uh, it will take a very long time to even compute something as basic as 30. Um, you could do quicker on a piece of paper by yourself than asking your computer to compute it with that program. Because what happens with something as small as just 10 is this. So you ask it to compute uh, Fibonacci of 10, and it will first have to compute Fibonacci of 9 and 8. But to do 9 and 8, first it does 9. It does 9. And to do 9, first it has to do 8. And, and it keeps recursing back until it gets to 1. When it gets to 1, it can go back uh, and say, all right, uh, that was 1. So it returns uh, the value back to you. But then uh, it's not enough because it has to go back and compute Fibonacci number of uh, 8. So this was 10. You have to compute 9 and 8. And 8, you have to redo so many of the same things that you already did before. Because here also, when you said 8, uh, sorry, 9, it's not enough just to compute 8, 7, 6. For 8, in turn, you have to go back and compute 7 uh, and 6. And for 7, you have to go back and compute 6. So you recompute the same things so many times. Uh, it's uh, easy to even lose track here. This is how many times you have to return something. So every time there's an error like this, one of these things returns a result. And look how many times you have to go back before you finally get the two things that you can add up uh, to return this number. So with, uh, um, with these nested uh, double calls, it's not the fact that you have two calls. It's the fact that each call recomputes things that you've, uh, you're computing over and over again. And so these things uh, ends up with a number, uh, an exponential number of calls, uh, which makes your program extremely slow and inefficient. So something... like this, which may look like a mess compared to this, it may look inelegant. It's actually, if you read through it, it's simply, well, if it's uh, one of the first two, then the result is one. But otherwise, set the basic uh, start of the chain to one. And then uh, for every next element, just add the two previous ones and shift, add the two previous ones and shift. And the result is uh, the end and return. So this is just an iterative version, doesn't call itself uh, is the thing you did when you were in kindergarten and you were adding them up. Uh, and this is actually a much better idea. So because it's, it looks easier to express things this way, well, not that much easier in this case, but in many cases, the formulation that goes from the top down and uh, uses recursion is a bad idea for computing the result. However, it is an easy way to describe the solution to the problem. There's a trick you could use to um, 
to resort to this formulation without spending so much time. And that is, uh, use that, but every time you actually return a result, remember it somewhere. So you make yourself a little memo, and you write, okay, I actually already computed Fibonacci of three, and the result is two. Uh, and so next time you're asked to do Fibonacci of three, instead of uh, recursing down, you say, ah, and this was two. And then when the next time you're asked to do Fibonacci of seven, you don't have to recurse. You read it up from the table of things you computed earlier. So you pay the price only once for each result. You don't recompute the same results many times. So this is called memoization. Not the memorization, memoization. And it's a technique for uh, rescuing these otherwise uh, pathetically inefficient recursive formulations of these problems. So dynamic programming, this is not dynamic programming, but dynamic programming is a, a technique that can be used to tackle problems where there is this feature that the optimal solution to the big problem involves optimal solutions to smaller problems which overlap and which if you did in the uh, regular brute force or top-down way, you would end up recomputing many times. The same problems would be recomputed so many times. So memoization is a technique whereby each component problem is only computed once. And so you save yourself uh, from falling into that trap. 